Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're going to talk about NASA's psychic mission. So let's dive deep into it. So what is this mission? Well, this mission was announced in January 2017. Now be mindful, it was under works and people were working on it for a very long time. But in 2017, it was like, okay, this is a go ahead, we're going to do this. It happens. NASA just does not randomly like this is the mission we're going to do. There is generally a very thorough selection uh, made and they may have multiple parallel projects running and then they're like finalize it. This is the final one. Let's build it. So in January 2017, this puppy got the green light. Now target of this thing is this puppy. Now this is first metallic asteroid. Now be mindful, metallic asteroids are rare AF. And this would be the first time we are going to study metallic asteroid. We have been going to uh, asteroids recently, you must have seen, be it a DART mission or be it Japanese mission, uh, Hayabusa missions. We have been going to asteroids. We got that part sorted, but we have never had the luxury to go to metallic objects. So this is the... Uh, target of our study and first launch window supposed to be in July 2022 again 2017 it was the start date July, uh, launch time was July 2022 reasonable now it got delayed why it got delayed there was an investigation and uh, be mindful this is the like peak time was they built the thing but they did not have enough time and enough uh, uh, basically faith in their testing system where it's like no we just built it but like we need time to test it there is no undo here you cannot just like you know amazon return 24 hours so they re want nasa wanted more time to test it thoroughly now investigation showed that they were understaffed there was very serious miscommunication and all the hassle basically there was no ill intent here there was some serious uh, basically mismanagement and of course understaffing so it was a miracle that it was even done but now the launch, uh, launch date is 5 October 2023. There is a little bit of wiggle room and thankfully it's a requirement simply because you may want to actually, uh, you know, postpone in case of a rocket failure or in case of a weather event. So there is a bit of leeway. Target is that. And by when it will arrive there, it's going to be a long mission. It's going to take August 2029. So it's going to be a long mission to take this puppy and eat it here. It's going to take some time. And that's the mission patch. And this is NASA's logo. So this is the mission that we are talking about. So how the heck we're going to move this? Well, we're going to take some heavy puppy. So we're going to take Falcon Heavy and it's going to do the primary job of lifting it into orbit and then doing what we classify as injection burn, eating it out there. After that, it's going to go to Mars and leach a little bit of energy from Mars and then be like gravitationally assisted in 2026. So uh, be patient, like take your time, forget about it, is something like that. And then after that, because be mindful, it's going from uh, even further than that. So it is going to utilize solar electric propulsion. And it, this puppy has four engines. Uh, engines are SPT-140 Hall effect thrusters, this puppy basically. Now does it gonna use all four of them most likely not but it could use it for short durations it's not the limitation of the engine it's the limitation of the uh, basically array array is super powerful it's almost 20 kilowatt of power when it's uh, basically near earth however these panels are very unique because they are tri-junction like you must have known like no matter what you do if you are using a single crystal structure you only gonna get at max 20 25 percent efficiency so how do you make a panel that is more efficient well add multi-junction Tri-junction is the most complex one. This has tri-junction. Now, there is a benefit of that, that in Earth, it's not very efficient. Why? It's getting cooked, basically. So, what does it mean? That simply means, is even though it's producing more power, in like from photon to watt conversion, it's not that efficient. But as it starts to go further, it becomes more and more efficient. So, uh, even at very low intensity, luminance of solar, uh, like from its vantage point of psychic, it still will have more than like around uh, half kilo, more than half kilowatt of reliable power. So solar is really like solar panels are really complex and that's why it has four of those engines and it can give you 4.5 kilowatts of thrust which I think just after Mars it was supposed to have that kind of power and then it may do uh, accelerated acceleration and then it has 900 watts of sustained meaning if it needs to do long term correction which it will need to do at psychic to you know control its orbit that would be 900 watts bit less bit more but that is the target point what kind of propellants it needs it needs almost one ton 922 kilograms of xenon what kind of specific impulse specific impulse in space would be around 1800 second that's the core benefit of going through this hassle of having super expensive solar panels and uh, very lightweight uh, engines it will give exponential efficiency like best case scenario you are looking at 500 seconds of a specific impulse and i'm exaggerating you're generally not going to get that much but from 500 to going to this that's bonkers 
and it's also very gentle so structure is not uh, you know under a lot of strain or temperature so it's a really gentle way of like accelerating this puppy so that's the propulsion part taken care of then let's look into instrument now instrument it has multi-spectral image system basically this uh, lens there is a sensor here this is a filter wheel this is the lens and the filter wheel has eight slots uh, basically this is a sensor it has eight slots and one slot is empty uh, three of them is red blue green others uh, scientific things so and be mindful there is not just one camera there are two camera of it uh, not only for uh, basically scientific development actually mainly for redundancy so if they are like hey we are building this might as well just build two of it and then be like done and it improves their uh, resolution basically how much cadence uh, they can do it improves it and it does gives them redundancy because it's also be helped be, uh, to for navigation cameras so they're gonna use this now they're gonna use this sensor that is from kotak now, like wait a minute kotak makes digital sensor yes and no i have no idea why the heck uh, if i look into the spec sheet it's kotak but it's from on a semiconductor on semiconductor made this and uh, it's if you Take the raw one. There is a one that has a bare filter into it. Now this is a raw sensor. This raw sensor can give you very good visibility from visible wavelength to short wave near infrared. Not a like you know deep infrared, but short wave infrared. Uh, resolution is around 1600 by 1200, so around one or two megapixel. It's not as wide as a, a 16 by 9, but it's square, but it's very close to full HD. And it's a one inch uh, sensor and. CCD now be mindful CCD we do not use in like day-to-day -day life because it's expensive but if you have money as not as a constraint where like quality is the constraint you will always choose CCD most sensor in space is generally CCD again if you are a low cost satellite operator that's a different thing but if you money is not an object you're generally going to use CCD and it also gives them global shutter so uh, trying to capture moving objects good so it has that now what about the lens lens is 148 millimeter lens and f 1.8 what about focus it's fixed focal from far to infinity so it's fixed focal it does not have a focusing system now they are using that's just the optics part gamma ray uh, basically neutron spectrometer again why the heck they're going for gamma ray the critical aspect is they are trying to ascertain metal metal is thick in terms of things that are going through in it coming out of it only few things can do that like normal optical photons will just bounce off it will not penetrate so it's not a, like ice where sunlight can give you if long with long exposure you can actually see inside ice to some extent uh, you can't do that it's not ice it's not dirt so you, you can't use like you know uh, x-rays and all that you need something that goes really deep gamma rays and neutrinos and deep space you have bombardment of neutrinos so if you have a way to counter uh, understand neutrinos you can have a proper system where it's like hey in one side i have this neutrino source cosmic neutrino source is producing this much i'm taking the background radiation then i'm out other side of the system now i'm getting different reading now you can calculate and neutrinos gamma rays that's the reason and neutrinos when they dump energy some of the times they can also emit gamma rays so they have to go very complicated gamma rays, high energy particle cal calculation simply because they want to be damn sure they are looking inside the metal and magnetometers. Now, if this puppy works properly and we detect magnetometers as in like actual magnetic field, they're either like a permanent magnet or a residual magnetic field, that will be big, like it would be big. I will explain further, but like that's a big thing. It has X uh, band gravity science center because we might feel this is a big puppy, but not very big. Now. Celestial objects have laws. Now that law is da shall become a ball. So if you are big, like let's say 300 kilometers, you will become a ball. Like there is nothing that will stop you from becoming a ball. You will because the gravity will apply law to you. It's the power of the law. So gravity will make you, but what if you are not that big? Like I'm not talking very small, like 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, but what if you are like somewhere around that ugly spot where it's like you're not very, uh, you know, strong enough where your, your gravity will make you around, but you're not weak enough. So you have an ovaloid kind of shape where it's like, eh, what happens then? And your gravity becomes hululu, meaning your gravitational smoothness is worst, like really, really bad. Big objects generally have very smooth gravity. So you can put a satellite very close to its orbit and it's going to be stable. Like for example, on Earth, we can do very close uh, to basically surface. Uh, but on Moon, we cannot do that. Now look, why? Well, we try that and it turns out the gravitational smoothness is not there. So satellite at some point will accelerate, some point will decelerate. So it's like, it's very uh, short term stable. So we need a way to measure the gravity. And do we do that? Well, yes. Uh, have you ever looked into Google map and noticed that all the oceans have a low resolution map of it? It's like we know how ocean surface looks. How the heck we know that? Using gravity. So we know how to map gravity and that allows us to look beneath something. 
So this object given its size, we should be able to get some estimate of what it looks inside. Especially if magnetic field is there, uh, we should be able to create some detailed high resolution map. And I have faith in this thruster uh, sensor basically. Uh, it is intraline CCD, KAI 2020. So let's look into the psyche, uh, 16 psyche. Now this is an M type asteroid. Now this is a big puppy. So we discovered this early on, as in 1852 kind of early on. So we got this, we have known this. Now why it has 16 in front of it? Apparently it's 16th minor planet discovery. Like uh, Pluto is now a minor planet. So same thing is like with this. It's like, it's actually big. So we kind of decided this is a 16th iteration, so to say. So that's why it has that number. Now what's the size? Size is expected to 220 kilometer. That's why I said this puppy is big. Like you can see that it's almost a circle. Now these images are collaboration of image from all other uh, instruments, but you can see that it's very low resolution. Like it's few pixels. And this is, this is artistic rendition. This is what we really have as of now. So what's so unique about it? Well, the density. Density is bonkersly high. Our best estimate be mindful it's an estimate puts it around four to five x of water meaning if you have the exact same volume of water uh, water will be light and be mindful if rebels are generally not compacted like very high density and water is kind of heavy like water is heavy so ice we figure it out like it's lower than uh, water water again it's like a, if it's just a clump of liquid for some reason it would be that then you have dust, gravel, lightly bound particle. That's how we figured it out. And this puppy is dense, meaning there is a very good chance it's actually denser than many moons. Like how the heck that's possible? Well, denser, not massive, denser, because it's just the core. It's just whenever you are talking about a planetoid, generally you have stuff and then stuff collapse. Gravity collapses it. When you gravity collapses you, it increases your temperature. What happens in temperature? If temperature increases, your core becomes molten. What happens if your core is molten? Gravity plays a role. It literally starts to stratify your element based on the density. So had densest material, basically your uranium, lead, uh, nickel, cobalt, copper, iron, all these heavy stuff goes down goes to the center of it and if you can slice a planet perfectly half like an anime you will literally see the densest periodic table built like this so majority of the earth's heavy stuff is in the core so what about the things that we find on the crust that's less than one percent so this is dense enough where it's almost like with our current estimate this is a planet core so that's why we are so interested into it now question is how the heck it can be a planet core it's not a fully built planet not even a large planet so uh, i'm not even talking about like you know 700 kilometers or 800 it's like why the heck this could be a planet well it's not but our best estimate is that same thing happened basically uh, heavy particles got there it clumped during the early uh, stages of solar system formation things started to happen collaboration happened more collaboration happened more gravity happened more temperature happened more melting happened all of these things were going fine however during these things something else hit it something most likely generally bigger than this or some event happened they forced it to be ejected from its own basically magma so to say so it got ejected out of it that's our current estimate okay once we actually go there study it then we'll know because this is very dense the density is bonkersly high so something extreme would have happened. Oh, now be mindful, that's a normal thing to happen in early solar system formation. Jupiter and Saturn, they were not there yet. They were under construction, so the vacuum cleaner effect was not there. So right now, this is a very uh, early snapshot of early planet construction. So that's why it's so interesting to study. And that's why you must have seen people going YOLO over it. It's like it's billions of dollars and trillions of dollars and hululu amount of dollars. It's like, yeah, it's 100% useless. Yeah, on paper, it does have all the metals. Like it has more metal than Earth's crust, not compared to Earth's core, but Earth's crust in principle. You can't actually do it. And it's like people don't understand economics. It's like if you dump that kind of gold, gold value will go down. It's like people must have watched Avatar original. It's like, you know, hex trillion dollars uh, mineral. It's like there is no use of a hex trillion dollar mineral. It's like if you if something is like, you know, room temperature superconductor is that expensive, nobody's going to use it. It's like, bro, normal uh, warm, super, uh, warm temperature superconductor that requires liquid nitrogen to work. It's exponentially cheaper. I'm just going to use that. So that's why do not focus on the money value. It has no money value. And if you dump that kind of oomph into your economy, value will go down. It's like if everybody wears a Rolex, Rolex have no value. So that's 16 Psyche. Then we come to the interesting part. The interesting part is DSOC. Now that whole thing is a mission. So NASA was like, what if we add some extra love to it? So this love, it's DSOC. They have added this. 
Now, the idea is this puppy will allow very high data rate even in deep space. Now, you must have paid attention even to my own videos. I have talked about this uh, deep space optical communication multiple times. So why the heck it's always a test, not a like final thing. Well, NASA does this in steps. They have levels, level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, level six. Level six and seven is something like final. It's like just control C, control V. You want a uh, communication, level seven means you can just install it. You do not have to do testing or like trials and backups and all that. It's like, it's a known technology, sorted. So, Optical communication, we have been trying. We have tried it with low Earth orbit, with ISS. We have tried it with a bit further away, as in lunar communication. But we have not tried so far to deep space. So this will be the deep space communication. If it works out, this will force uh, basically deep space optical communication standard to go up from level 5 to level 6, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, level 6 means now it's like almost just trust it. It, it's a reaching a point where it's like we have enough data if it's not working something is defective it's not like the principle is untested we got the principle sorted so they're going to use this puppy caltech uh, paloma uh, p a l o uh, paloma observatory now that puppy has giant mirror it's 5.1 meter huge mirror uh, as a receiver and what about the receiver on the satellite end satellite end is 22 centimeter so that's a very big ratio uh, that's happening. The psychic telescope is 22 centimeter. The telescope on Earth is 5.1 meter. Now, sit down. The most awesome name that I could even come up with is the sensor that is there that is going to actually, you know, receive the signal. Here's the sensor name. I'm not joking. Sensitive, superconductive, nanowire, photon, counting, receiver. It's like they just took all the buzzword. Sensitive, awesome. Superconductive, awesome. Nanowire, awesome. I'm like, I'm not joking. Like Rick and Morty had an episode. It's like nano water and all that. It's like nanowire, man. Photon counting. It's that sensitive. It actually can count photon as in like energy packets itself. And the wavelength is 1550. So you're not going to see the laser. Uh, 1550 near infrared. And that's how it looks. Like inside an electron microscope. That puppy is the sensor. <laughs> So this is what um, basically NASA is trying to do. If you have same amount of energy for microwave communication and same amount of energy for uh, basically uh, laser communication, laser will always be far more collimated. It's a fact of wavelength itself. The shorter the wavelength, the more collimated it can be made or especially with laser, it's really, really collimated. So if you send a signal from uh, Mars, it will spread out a lot, meaning you're going to need huge dish to capture it. Basically, if the same amount of energy is used for radio, they're going to need much bigger than 5 meter. They may need 100 meter. And I'm not even joking. Some radio dishes are huge for that reason. It spreads out a lot. So if to collect enough photons to create enough signal, uh, it requires a huge dish. Deep Space Network has huge dish for that reason. So the idea with uh, laser is that the amount of dish space we need will go down drastically and bit rate will go up exponentially. So in this system, where they are experimenting with this wavelength, they are touching gigabits per second. Again, this is a simulated system. I genuinely do not think they're going to reach even gigabit per second uh, when it's like, you know, 20, 30 light minutes away. I do not think that can be done. Again, early stages. Nanowire. <laughs> they have four of it. Uh, four quadrature is there. Uh, so, but let's say it's a very interesting thing and uh, 800 megabits have been tested with moon and all that. So it can be done and compared to all other system, it's exponentially faster. And be mindful, this if this puppy works out properly, it means future uh, missions. We have the solar panel. We have, heck, we ha can have uh, nuclear reactors there. We got that part sorted. It's just that how do you communicate? Like we can make a much more amazing Voyager mission. There is just no point because we cannot transmit enough data fast enough. Our sensors will overproduce, like sensors will be bottlenecked by the uh, link backwards. So to make sure that link itself is no longer the issue, we got sensors, like one megapixel, two megapixel sensor, I'm reasonably sure if they wanted to, they could have put like 50 megapixel sensors there. It's just, there was no point. Even if they can electronically do it, they will not be able to transmit it reliably enough. So getting this technology, uh, you know, working, it's completely required from NASA's point of view. They have to have this. And Sensitive superconductive nano wire photon counting receiver. <laughs> I really like the name. So, this is the receiver part. So, this was my presentation on NASA's psychic mission. Hopefully, you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if, if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.